Hello, welcome all. This is Mary Chonar from SALT. Today we're meeting for the final public session devised as part of the Climate War Seasons Made to Drift exhibition by Cooking Sections. The exhibition is on view at SALT Paolo until October 24, so for anyone who's in Istanbul. Uh, we will soon be joined by political scientist and, and anthropologist James C. Scott and Alan Schwabe and Daniel Fernandez Pascual of Cooking Sections for the talk titled States, Nomads and Agriculture. Their conversation will be based on one of the five case studies in the exhibition, Exhausted, which examines the idea of fertility in the soil and the human body. On behalf of SALT, I'd like to thank Koch University Publishing and Anatoly Lit Agency for getting us together with uh, James C. Scott, who's the Director of Program of Agrarian Studies at Yale uh, University, and is known for his work on political anthropology, rural societies, comparative politics and anarchism, particularly in South Asia. He's also the author of seminal books, such as Domination and the Arts of Resistance, Hidden Transcripts, and Seeing Like a State. His latest book, Against the Grain, A Deep History of the Earliest States, questions whether a grain-based diet and urbanized population was the best possible way of living, or that it was the most convenient for the rulers. Focusing on Mesopotamia, the book examines the forces that were effective in the formation of the first political ruling classes and challenges anthropological discourses that portray the development of states as a civilizing process, turning this mainstream historical narrative upside down, which is part of one of the starting and or inspirational points uh, for, for many of the questions that are part of the Climate War Seasons Made to Drift exhibition. So thank you all for joining us and listening to us. Now I invite James and Cooking Sections uh, for, for their conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Merit. And thank you for everyone who is joining us today. It's really a wonderful pleasure to be in conversation with you, James. Um, James is someone that we have followed his work for many, many years and has been incredibly influential in developing our practice cooking sections and also kind of when being invited four years ago by Merich and Salt to develop this exhibition that took its name um, Crime of Our Seasons Made to Drift and that has been thinking about different climatic and environmental transformations in Turkey over past centuries and also recent decades. So we thought <clears throat> to, to begin with, we could give a, a couple of words about the exhibition framework and how we came to, to develop the different aspects. So we'll be sharing screen uh, just to show a couple of images for the audience to get a sense of how things look like in Istanbul at the moment in the space of salt. Um, so these, um, as Merich was saying, the the whole framework of climate over seasons made to drift started with the geography congress that happened in Turkey in the 1940s. And basically it was a meeting where for the first time in the, in the Republic, geographers got together to describe and put together the climate of the nation. Uh, and basically uh, it was, the territory was subdivided into seven regions with uh, their own climates and products, right? So each place would were supposed to have a certain weather, humidity, temperature in average. And so also they would be able to produce certain products. And that's something that when we started learning about it, it was quite striking that even until today, those regions are still taught in the same way, despite, despite the fact that most of these weather conditions are shifting perhaps the boundaries of the regions are also shifting and the food produce that is uh, being uh, harvested from those regions is also changing. So that's why also the idea of seasons made to drift uh, came about and the different parts of the exhibition that very quickly we can show. So one part talks about weathered and, and how to use these different records uh, in trees to understand these uh, different climatic events and famines, uh, some of which might or might not have been uh, constructed uh, or shaped by different global economic powers. Another the, piece, yeah. the second piece, um, the lasting pond, basically looks into pastoralist practice and cultivation of water buffaloes on the outskirts of Istanbul 
a practice that existed in for a few centuries and also benefited quite a lot from the fact that in like with the kind of exhaustion of peatland um, in the outskirts of Istanbul, a lot of these former mines were filled with water and kind of became perfect wallowing um, spaces for the buffaloes. And with now the development of like massive infrastructures in Istanbul, like airports and a proposed um, canal, basically a lot of this kind of um, environment and ecology is being threatened. And one of the things that we've done for the exhibition is basically dig um, a new wallow and use the clay that was um, taken from the ground to produce over a thousand uh, sutlach and yogurt pots that are being filled with buffalo milk dessert and buffalo yogurt and are kind of available at the shop um, just uh, down the street from Sol's space. But the installation that we'll be talking about tonight with, with you, James, is exhausted, as we were mentioning. And this is an, a compilation of over 100 objects um, that we've been uh, assembling over the past years, uh, basically collecting stories from the Neolithic in Anatolia and the so-called Fertile Crescent, uh, all the way to kind of more kind of modern times that try to put together the different versions of fertility, uh, but also infertility. So how we came to a point where uh, there was a certain veneration of fertility through gods and goddesses that is it's contested all the way to the 20th century when more and more artificial synthetic fertilizers and petrochemical insecticides and pesticides have been used to the point that many bodies, human and more than human, are becoming infertile because of those endocrine disruptors that are entering uh, the water systems um, in the Fertile Crescent, but also beyond, and have made um, Istanbul one of the global hubs for IVF and infertility treatments uh, in the world. So kind of with that um, framework in mind, we have prepared some questions um, for our conversation, which I think kind of a lot of the work that you've developed over the years can really illuminate um, further some of um, the different objects and different kind of threads and stories that exist um, in this exhibition. And I think perhaps one of the starting points for this conversation could be just some of these objects that we see here on the screen um, and that many of them kind of elaborate on the mythology around powerful goddess and goddesses providing kind of sacred gain to a chosen people. And those veneration narratives of soils, of bodies and grain have been constructed by many archeologists, specifically in the 20th century in Anatolia and Mesopotamia. And I think it's interesting to refer here to perhaps one of the more known cases that we're seeing just here in front of the screen and which is kind of really a, maybe perhaps the starting point of this whole um, project exhausted, exhausted, which is a figure dug um, at the site of Chatalhuyuk in the 1960s. It was initially thought to be an Anatolian mother goddess, yet in recent years, archaeologists such as uh, Maria Gimbutas argued that these cultures were collective groups that were most likely matri matrilineal, ma matrilocal, and matrifocal and not projections of contemporary Western nuclear family structures. So in a sense, the clay sculpture that was found in the grain storage room at Chatarhoyuk, archeological site in Anatolia, is believed to complement the sedentary evolutionary narrative, whereby the success of human reproduction was dependent on domesticated grains. Now, for non-state and non-sedentary pastoralist people thriving on wild grains at the time, this would not have been necessarily the case, right? And as you describe it in the seemingly natural progression from foraging to, farm or to farming is really farm is far from given. So as communities often actively avoided the perceived benefits of living in one place and the associated mores of, of more in, like of being concentrated with disease a conscription, forced labor, and taxes. So 
for us, what was interesting to look at through the installation and some of these artifacts was the more recent work that actually dismantles some of these narratives of the mid 20th century of these figurines not necessarily being um, reproductive bodies associated with fertility um, or mother goddesses, but rather how they are now starting to be read as just elderly or powerful women in a more gender equal uh, community whose bodies rather convey uh, wisdom or, or prosperity. And one of the, the strong arguments that emerges from your research, James, for us is, a, is in a way reflected in, in some of these other forms of progress or, or contested versions of what that evolution was, um, as it is always not 100% clear whether these female figurines needed to be fertility goddesses at all, or maybe not even reproductive subjects. Um, so yeah, these are different archaeological interpretations uh, of how our ancestors lived are in a way in constant revision. And, and we'd like to start perhaps by asking you whether um, you anticipate also the, the history of these sedentary societies of, or, or human development to be constantly being challenged, challenged by more and more narratives, right? So you've been de deconstructed some of these. But how would you see also the evolution of these narratives in the coming years, especially as more um, objects and artifacts are dug in these, ar these archaeological sites? And, and how do we also embrace more dynamic views of how these sedentary societies uh, engaged with fertility at all? Sorry, James, you need to... Yeah, mute it now. Yeah. There we go. Yeah. Uh, uh, I feel the handicap of not having uh, been given a personal tour through the actual exhibition. Um, so uh, I feel that I'm operating at a rather abstract distance. Um, and I, uh, there's a lot I would, I would like to have in terms of your narrative, that, that is the creator's of the ex, uh, exhibition and why things are organized in the way they are uh, and uh, what the viewer uh, whom you have in mind, uh, you expect will draw uh, from these. Um, with respect to um, the, the so-called fertility goddesses, right? And the narratives, I guess the first thing to say is that the point of the book that I wrote called Against the Grain is that it was not, I did nothing particularly original in terms of my own research, but what I did was to try to put together what we've discovered in archeological findings for the last 20 or 30 years. Um, uh, and it has completely revolutionized, I think, the idea of the rise of sedentary communities in agriculture that we was generally taught in school books and probably still are. Um, and so the point being that um, what we have to start with our own ignorance. And so if you imagine in the last 20 years, we have overturned a lot of what we thought we knew about the establishment of sedentary communities, it stands to reason, doesn't it, that in the next 20 years, um, we will discover a great many more things that will overturn everything that I had to say or most of what I had to say. Um, uh, and the picture will become both more precise, more granular, uh, and probably more documented, which is the whole point of archeology span here. Um, I don't have anything particularly original to say about the fertility goddesses. I think what, what we do appear to know, again, provisionally, is that in general, uh, hunting and gathering and foraging communities appear to have roughly two children slightly more than two children, whereas sedentary grain communities tend to have four surviving children. Um, 
Here we're talking about surviving children. And the, the point is, I suppose, that there are, it is assumed, a series of strategies that hunters and gatherers, because they are moving all the time, and find it difficult to sort of have a lot of toddlers, right, whom they have to carry from place to place, they limit their reproduction as much as they can, which may include infanticide, uh, in fact, historically. Um, and we, we know from Swana uh, and where you have hunters and gatherers and foragers and the same cultural group now sedentized, we're able to make some provisional generalizations about um, the actual live births uh, that sedentary communities have vis-a-vis -vis hunting and gathering and foraging communities. Um, and the fact that what is interesting to me, and it's in a sense highlighted by um, the presumption that we may simply be dealing with matriarchal, matrifocal, matrilocal societies, uh, rather than simply uh, as symbolism of of fertility is that um, the kinship terms and patriarchal families are a product of the state. Um, that is to say, it, before you have a state, you do not have uh, patriarchal lineages of segmentary societies. Um, so they, and then what's interesting is that in a patriarchal society, um, which may be patrilocal and patrifocal uh, as well, um, the reproductive services of women are part of the property of the patriarch, right? Um, and so it stands to reason that one of the ways of generating wealth in a patriarchy is to maximize the number of children and to treat uh, wives, concubines, uh, slaves, and so on, not just as free labor, but as reproductive bodies um, that will produce the manpower or person power uh, that is so important in these societies for control over resources. Because I'll, I'll finish soon. In, in early societies, it's the number of people you can assemble around you that count in terms of power because the ratio of population to natural resources is quite small, that there are all kinds of places people can run away to. Uh, and power derives not directly from control over land originally, but it, it, it emanates from control over people. Uh, and that becomes extremely important when you have a patriarchal family. Yeah, no, I think it's a, it's a really great point. And I think continuing kind of on this, in, on the societal transformation that takes place in this period, also it would be great to discuss the notion of collapse in early states and and when kind of states um, appear and, and most uh, more importantly disappear. And it's a theme, a theme that fascinated us for quite a long time and I think has a lot of connection to certain kind of periods or a period that we're living through at the moment um, around like a global pandemic. And, and especially I think when we see such an exodus and I think it's something that is true, um, at, especially in place in the global North, in the US and in Europe and here in the UK, where people are kind of abandoning big, big cities and moving out to the countryside, right? And in Against the Grain, you speculate that the abandonment of early state centers might have actually been um, intentionally planned to preempt the collapse of its members living in close proximity and kind of trying to avoid recurring lethal um, epidemics rather than those settlements just directly collapsing in and of themselves. Um, so in that regard, it's also, it's of course, in, this has created different ways of reading archaeology and interpreting artifacts, um, like the different Neolithic figurines that we were referring to earlier and that are part of our exhibition at SOT.
So could you elaborate a bit on the collapse or escape from the main power centers in early agrarian states? And also perhaps connected to how we came to see sedentarism equaling to progress and nomadism equaling to barbarians um, as such as like, and seeing it as such as distinct kind of binary that they think in many right. ways really permeates about our thinking, you know, until today. So what's an, uh, it's a great point and a good question. Um, what perhaps deserves emphasis first is the one thing that we clearly had misunderstood historically about the transition between hunting and gathering and sedentary communities is the idea that when we domesticated grain, wheat in the case of um, uh, the Middle East, uh, when we domesticated grain, immediately that allowed us to become sedentary. One thing and, that and clearly... And the, the assumption was that we desperately wanted to settle down, right? There's a, it's an unstated assumption that everybody would prefer to be sedentary rather than to be mobile or nomadic. That's a question that needs uh, to be uh, resolved. It's not clear to me uh, that, and we know historically that nomadic tribes people who have been forcibly settled have uh, gone to war and run away uh, in order to avoid being settled in one place. Maybe the most important thing to say about this um, is that um, the Neolithic, so, so hunting and gathering and agriculture, it was not that hunting and gathering was everything and then suddenly it was nothing once we domesticated grains. The fact is there are 2000 years at the very least during which people are moving back depending on climate, rainfall, disease and so on between hunting and gathering and foraging on the one hand and agriculture on the other, mixing them both in proportions depending on the situation that they face. So there is not a, a stark transition. It's a long, long, long uh, transition. The other thing that I think perhaps um, speaks to your concern in the exhibition and the question of fertility and infertility um, is that Neolithic settlements are an artificial landscape. That is to say, hunters and gatherers are gathering things that are produced without their direct participation. Uh, agriculturalists have created a landscape, an artificial landscape that would not exist except for their disturbance of the soil, their planting, their tending, making of fences, perhaps watering, uh, uh, weeding the plants and so on. The point is that this completely artificial and novel revolutionary landscape of the Neolithic farmstead, if you like, or domus, as I call it in the book, has to be defended all the time. That is to say, nature would like to take it over. Uh, the birds would like to come and eat the seeds, the, right? Uh, particularly since you've changed the seeds from their non-domesticated form. Uh, the rats would like to come, uh, the wild animals would like to come, the insects and so on. And, and the point is that one of the things that makes the Neolithic landscape um, artificial and having to be defended is that it is also far more uniform form and less diverse than the landscape from which foragers are taking their food supply. That means in epidemiological terms that there are many of the same genetic plants close together there. And that goes for people too. Uh, these concentrations of sedentary communities are a large number of homo sapiens in one place 
20 or 30 times greater than has ever existed before the Neolithic, right? And they have domesticated animals that are also crowded and the same species as well. So the point is that any pathogen, any disease that attacks humans, crops, or livestock will find um, itself very happy to eat at the domus uh, because of all of the things that are gathered there as well. And although fertility rates and reproductive rates are higher uh, in the domus, so is mortality. And uh, my guess is, and this will be settled in the next 20 or 30 years perhaps, is that one of the reasons why many early small city states just blink out, disappear all of a sudden for no reason that we can discern. That is, we don't find evidence of fire or battles and so on. Um, I expect this had to do either with crop failure, crop diseases, livestock diseases, uh, or uh, human diseases, uh, because these were zoonotically, um, these were these were infectious diseases for humans uh, that had no, uh, they, they were completely new, they didn't exist before, and they are the artifact of crowding. And so for that reason, the, what strikes me is that the Neolithic landscape, its animals, its people, and its crops are all uniquely vulnerable because of crowding uh, to, um, to failure. Uh, by disease and parasites. Yeah, yeah, and I think also what it, the point was interesting that you were saying is these new waves of pathogens, right? That you want to keep these wild animals out or outside the the, the wall um, in order not to disrupt the the crops. But pathogens uh, also have to be kept in for that to work. Um, and also subjects, right? That you want to keep the enemy outside, but also your own subjects within the walls. Um, so within that also, and, and connecting to what you were saying before, this couple of thousand years um, between sedentism and perhaps the domestication of grain and the tax collecting wall states. Um, so perhaps if the, the question would be, um, whether or, or, or how also those societies that evolve from wetland abundance into these kind of grain domesticated grain dependent communities, uh, how easy was also for them to to escape that wall, right? Because on the one hand you were saying that many people might have agreed to kind of just dissolve and spread uh, in order to prevent disease. Uh, but also, I guess it was for the interest of some of those small states to, to keep people within the boundaries of the walls and keep controlling reproduction of both the land and the body. So, yeah, we're wondering how easy was it to, to escape, if escape was even an option, uh, before realizing that they all, all needed to spread out to avoid disease. So... It's a great question, and I wish I had a more definitive answer. Uh, for you. I, I think it's fair to say that running away from these states was not very hard. Um, and historically, of course, um, the, um, the response to an epidemic, a human epidemic, is for people to run away from the site of the epidemic. Um, yeah. the, the moment you have the sign of uh, a disease that you know is likely to overtake a city, everyone who can flee, flees. Um, that, then, of course, it means that they, they bring the disease off into outlying places themselves, <laughs> right? Uh, so the city becomes what we call a super spreader um, uh, effect as well. But the point is that um, I don't think these states, um, when they had either the crop failures or the livestock diseases or the human infections, uh, I don't think they could stop um, much of the population from running away. And so a lot of the pulsating right, movement between dispersal and concentration uh, 
I think, had to do with these um, epidemiological conditions, again, for crops, people, and livestock. Um, so what, what I don't understand, um, uh, maybe you could, maybe you have an answer to this, because I, um, I didn't study it in great detail. It is often said, uh, and I think established now, that the Great Walls of China were built to keep Chinese taxpayers and cultivators inside the wall, rather than to keep the barbarians out. Now, in the Mesopotamian alluvium, where there's a, um, a little um, choke point between the Tigris and Euphrates, there was, I will mispronounce this, I'm afraid, I, I apologize to all Turkish speakers, the Salgis Wall, uh, S-A-L-G-I. It was, an, I, I think, a king who established this wall. And the theory is that this was to prevent, a, prevent Amorite uh, barbarian uh, invasions. Um, and I wonder whether it was rather intended just as much to keep in Mesopotamian taxpayers, right? And prevent them from running away. But most of these things are not very, uh, are not historically very successful. Uh, even the modern state. Uh, so, for example, the other thing, of course, um, if you're interested in uh, accounts of epidemics, um, uh, Daniel Defoe's book, The Journal of the Plague Year, I recommend to you, was 1666, I think, the last English plague. Um, and what's interesting to me, I assume that the plague... Uh, killed poor and rich uh, alike. And of course, I was completely wrong. Um, mm -hmm. The rich uh, moved right away uh, outside to their country estates. Um, even in those days, Oxford and Cambridge had cottages to which they would disperse their students once um, an epidemic was uh, observed. Uh, and it was basically the poor who had to travel around uh, and stay in the city and couldn't leave for economic reasons and so on, had nowhere to go, um, who suffered the most. So the um, mortality was exactly correlated with uh, social class and capacity for mobility. I think in the era that we're talking about, 4,000 BC, uh, 3,000 BC, um, that everyone probably had connections outside the city uh, with families and villages and so on, um, so that movement was easier uh, than it would have been in 17th century England. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think maybe perhaps also kind of continuing on this question of class and kind of the organization of society and how kind of different part, like different peoples were susceptible to different kind of movements of the environment. I think one of the things also... It's interesting to think about the transition between wetland societies and valley states or the transition from kind of one to the other and which eventually led to the dependence on agriculture for both nourishment and tax collection. And I think you kind of already mentioned that in, in your previous point about all of these kind of barriers that were created, right? And whether... And you wrote about it very beautifully in various of your books about natural barriers and kind of man-made barriers that were kind of trying to create this friction in the terrain. And you also mentioned the example of areas in Anatolia from which one perhaps could gather enough wild wheat in three weeks to feed a family for a whole year. And I think for us, it's a very simple question. It's like, why are we working so hard then today, right? And and how, what happened in this kind of transition? And to what extent um, did grain agriculture change society um, from back then to the present day? Or in other words, you know, to what extent, extent grain domestication also domesticated us? Right. Um, so that that's the big question. Uh, uh, why did we do this in the first place? Why would you want to knock yourself out uh, uh, preparing land and so on? So uh, 
one uh, one thing that is actually uh, easier to observe historically in the Nile is that the very, very earliest form of fixed field agriculture, sedentary agriculture, was what I call flood recession agriculture in which there's a natural flood every year. It does a lot of your farming for you. That is to say, it kills all the existing, right? Foliage and flora, right? It deposits silt that has a lot of nutrition and fertilizer naturally in it. Uh, it then recedes and you can throw seed and have a little crop uh, by following the water back into the channel. And that is a form of agriculture that is as lazy uh, as humans. Uh, I mean, you want, we, we avoid as work as much as possible. Um, and in this case, um, uh, this was, uh, if you like a form of sedentary agriculture, the only form that was competitive in terms of labor, uh, of labor input uh, with, uh, than with hunting and gathering. And that's why it was the first agriculture to be practiced. So that agriculture doesn't need a lot of explanation because it's easy and competitive on a small scale. What's in, what we don't know, and I don't know, partly because archeologists are still debating this, is why you had these uh, concentrations of population in certain areas, right? Um, growing grain. And there are three explanations for it. Uh, and the debate still goes on. And I am not uh, a specialist, as you know. So I am unqualified to decide between these different explanations. One explanation is climate change, in which it became colder and drier, and forced people back to the wetter areas where um, there was both pasturage uh, and places where you could practice some agriculture, right? Uh, back to the rivers, wet spots, uh, and so on. That's one theory and it's population growth, right? In which it, it succeeds the carrying capacity uh, of hunting and gathering, partly because lots of hunting and gathering areas are now not so productive because of the cold and dry weather. The second, um, is related to this and it's called the uh, wide spectrum revolution uh, in which easy forms of uh, food uh, supply, which would have been gazelles in that period, right? There was a gazelle migration. And if you were at the right place at the right time, uh, funneling the gazelles toward a killing field, you could get most of your protein for the year. And the argument is that uh, and there are evidence from parts of the new world of the large game, the, if you like, the easy uh, calories uh, disappearing because they were hunted out. Uh, and then one had to move lower in the tropic levels to forms of small animals, grain, uh, and so on. Um, there's a third explanation um, that I'm having trouble recalling right now. Um, uh, it'll come back to me. But the point is that this is a this is a debate that is unsettled among historians and archaeologists, um, and we don't know except it, it's if you like an observable fact that um, uh, that this occurred at a certain time. And my guess, and it's only a guess is that in a sense, the early state, uh, the early state did not create these concentrations of population. They were created either by the loss of hunting and gathering places of the climate change and so on and population growth. Uh, but it then used that as a scaffold to make the early, the early states. The other thing I do want to emphasize, which is uh, we, what we often, we often see the process of domestication of grain um, as um, a kind of human civilizational achievement. And one of the things I want to emphasize 
is that um, this, what I call the Neolithic module, um, is composed not just of our domesticated animals, human beings, and crops, the major grain, but lots of other insects and animals and rodents who find it very advantageous to live in this particular environment because of all the grain. So you get rats and mice who are there for the seeds. You get small cats that are there to kill the rats. Uh, you get birds who specialize in the seeds of crops. Um, so there's a whole cavalcade of parasites and insects and, 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 and flora weeds um, that actually move in because this is a um, favorable environment for them as well. They are not invited. They are, if you like, uninvited guests who compose this, um, uh, this um, Neolithic um, module. And over time, they become extremely important. So for example, my understanding is that two crops that we know as grains, like rye and, um, uh, and oats, they start out as weeds in wheat fields, mm -hmm. uh, as uninvited guests, because they grow well in the same disturbed soil as wheat does. Um, and so they seeded themselves, they blew their seeds apart earlier so that they could persist in these fields. And eventually, they became so hard to weed that people started treating them as a separate crop, right? Uh, but they began their career as bandits, if you like, or, or, or weeds, and then became a major, uh, a major crop. And so there's a, there's a and, the, and with respect to fertility, of course, as you know better than I, um, over time, the, the effect of wheat growing uh, meant this and the irrigation later, the salinization of soil to the point where you could no longer grow much wheat. It would be the, the yields would be very small. And so the, sh the, the predominance of barley over time, which will tolerate more saline soils than wheat, um, was a process that occurred at a pretty rapid scale in much of Mesopotamia. That's my understanding anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think that's a fascinating kind of was a story about these kind of weeds and how the, the these kind of species were in a way moving from the wild to being domesticated and with oats and barley reappearing or appearing as as weeds within the the wheat the wheat field or these uninvited guests. Um, right. and related to that, also we've been looking in the past months into more recent studies on rice and rye and, and wheat that actually are trying to understand uh, how some of these domesticated grains uh, are reversing domestication to a certain extent, uh, either through developing resistance to chemical herbicides or also through natural processes of basically regaining their wild characteristics um, within the monocrops. Uh, almost becoming feral or, or kind of escaping the fields they were initially put in. So in a way, there are different examples of, of these, um, like, for instance, the amaranth, type of amaranth in the south of the US or weedy rye, they call it, or weedy rice in, in California. So what is interesting is that they are becoming weedy, uh, right, as they once were, uh, but again today. So how would you, or would you read that almost as a survival tactic also for, for some of these grains to, to cope with intensive monoculture after centuries of domestication? And, and whether you could perhaps draw some parallels between these species going back to the to wilderness to a certain degree and non-state peoples also escaping. Um, <laughs> or, <okay>. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um... Well, I, I mean, you could, uh, you, you know, I've written things about people running away from the state yes. in Southeast we Asia. We love those, yes. And, and in fact, the um, what's interesting to me is that it's true for animals and plants as well, 
let's say, in the New World, the only places, you know, you find wolves and so on uh, generally in the U.S. is up in the mountains. And the wolves used to be a valley, right, um, uh, animal. The same for bears and the same for all kinds of plants. If you want to find all of the plants that existed before the Europeans came to North America, uh, then you have to go to the uplands because everything else has been transformed by agriculture and, uh, and, and planting. So uh, there's a lot to be said about that. Um, the uh, people who know more about the genetic makeup. So our general understanding of a domesticated crop is that it cannot survive without human attention, right? That if you, if you don't take care of it, uh, it will be overwhelmed and disappear. Uh, like many things, uh, it's true in different degrees for different kinds of plants and animals. So for example, uh, if you take the pig, uh, it's a domesticated animal, but it does very well as a feral animal, even today. Parts of California, Texas, and so on, hard to stop uh, feral boars, uh, right? It's true of bananas, historically. They're a plantation crop, but they also do well as a feral um, uh, entity. Uh, and so I think there's a, and I don't know how this geneticist could help us all, understand this better, the potential for uh, ferality, if that is a word I'm inventing, um, is different in different, uh, in different plants and different animals. And a lot of it has to do, I think, with their toleration for different uh, seasonal and climatic conditions, their ability to specialize in many different foods uh, uh, and so on. And so uh, it's, there's, a, there's an actually interesting website uh, helped uh, by my partner, Anna Singh, called Feral Atlas. So people who are interested in right, uh, ferality and, and also the consequences of pesticides and the introduction of invasive species and so on, it's about, um, all the unintended consequences that our interventions in the agricultural world uh, have had. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, no, it's a great point. And one of the, and also, yes, we highly, highly recommend um, Feral Atlas, which is a really incredible, incredible and extreme, extremely important like research and resource. Um, I think we would like to refer now to another um, case that is on display in the exhibition that we um, really, really um, love. And not only because uh, at the center of it is an image of um, a child that is put uh, inside a watermelon. And uh, this watermelon, the Dayarbaker uh, watermelon is was the fruit that was traditionally weigh, it weighed more than 50 kilos and it was really renowned for its size and flavor and also its farming technique. Uh, it was grown in wells that were dug in nutrient rich riverbeds that uh, all along the Tigris um, and it would kind of be planted there after kind of the floods at the spring around April, May. And I think this is something that we, you already very nicely referred to, um, to this kind of practices and their emergence um, with kind of the birth of agriculture. And I think what was also really interesting about um, this watermelon and the why, the reason why it's kind of is believed to have grown to such enormous sizes is because it was using a very particular kind of fertilizer um, called koga, which was basically made and collected from dove manure that uh, was kind of been uh, accumulated in very special dovecotes that were dotted around Anatolia and specifically around Dairbakir. Um, now, this was kind of a very prominent and an important export during the Ottoman Empire, but Koga today is no longer collected and 
And this has kind of really shaped or reshaped the size and the flavor um, of these watermelons. And to such an effect that like in 2018, if despite many efforts over the last decades to kind of preserve this agriculture kind of technique um, and tradition, basically farmers just kept uh, all the watermelons rotting in their field because the prices and kind of the support um, for this kind of practice didn't exist. So these oversized fruits are now only produced uh, for festivals and competitions that are still very famous. But I think for us, what is really interesting to think through this case is what is the value um, of agriculture preservation in the face of the climate emergency? And how do we see the role of the state or farmers in taking on preservation of heritage um, and the different varieties in that are more and more being industrialized, right? So these kind of very like var variants of different grains of different fruit, I mean, hold not only kind of culture and tradition, but also diversity, ecology, and kind of practices that are disappearing. And perhaps how can we think about their preservation and today? Did, um, just a question, did you say these watermelons were 50 kilos in weight? Yes. That's mind boggling. Um, <laughs> the, um, uh, so uh, I guess it, 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 this actually, um, this watermelon sounds like something the Americans would do, uh, you know, because we, we, we have an agricultural fair in my town, which is well known, and it just finished last week, actually. Uh, and there's this competition for the largest pumpkin, right? Um, and of course, this has to, this is done it's a pumpkin on steroids, right? It's kind of fed, right? Uh, in a way that's a kind of extreme version of industrial agriculture, right? Uh, infusions of vitamins and, uh, and so on. And I, there was in um, uh, somewhere in Japan, I can't remember where, Scuba uh, University had the biggest tomato plant in the world and its roots were in an enormous swimming pool of nutrients uh, and the tomatoes were produced in a trellis that ran for sort of like 30 feet, uh, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of tomatoes on the same plant that had been in existence for something like, uh, I think five years then. Anyway, these are, um, almost like lab experiments of, um, uh, of performance art almost. Uh, and so it, it, it seems to me that what, what is perfectly clear to everybody is that whenever there is a crop disease, watermelon or anything else, um, it is almost always the best solution is to find a variety in the diversity of watermelons, for example, that is immune to this particular pathogen, right? And to then um, cultivate watermelons with that genetic, those genetic characteristics. So if you lose that diversity, you lose, if you like, the natural correction uh, of diseases and pathogens by going back to the great variety, some of which are likely to be less uh, vulnerable or maybe completely immune, right, to, uh, to this particular pathogen. The other thing, of course, <clears throat> is to kill the pest, right? Um, and with insecticides, uh, let's say, or herbicides. Um, and the result of that as we all know, is to create super insects that are invulnerable to that particular insecticide. It's like um, an arms race, right? Uh, the genetic adaptation of the pest uh, plus the, um, uh, the poisons that are thrown at them. By the way, there's a, an astoundingly good book called Wilted um, that is by a woman named Julie Guthman. Uh, and it's about 
strawberry cultivation in California that has gone through uh, hundreds of efforts. And finally, they find themselves with a killer fungus that they cannot possibly extirpate, right? Uh, finally, at a dead end. But it's, a, it's an account of this uh, effort simply to kill pathogens, right? And its ultimate futility um, because of the ad adaptive capacities of that pathogens or other pathogens that move into the empty niche that's created. Yeah, no, I think it's interesting the, the role of the, the pathogen and, 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 the, and genetics at large in all these kind of contested kind of practices around agriculture and in a way perhaps connects to the idea of the friction of the terrain that we were mentioning before from the art of not being governed. And one of the proverbs that you mentioned that we really like mm -hmm. is the Han proverb um, say that like don't make a grain sale over a thousand li or 400 kilometers. Uh, maybe right. as yeah that you 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 wouldn't make enough profit uh, when you go so far away to collect taxes because the fodder for the oxen would be more than the the tax itself that you collect as a tax collector. Um, so yeah, we were wondering also whether if back then also it was the perhaps the barbarian or the non-state subject or non-subject the one that was threatening that kind of stability, whether perhaps pathogens and and non-compliant genes are almost the, the equivalent to that friction of the terrain, if to, to see a certain parallel today, or, or, or in other words, what would be that friction of the terrain today, if it's more connected to disease or, or molecular, things at the molecular level that are threatening that stability of the system. So, um, two things. Um, the uh, one it will not seem responsive right away to your questions, um, but it relates to cooking um, and the question of uniformity in a cultivar so that you're left with a narrow uh, band, right? Uh, a genetic band that's particularly vulnerable. That's of course was the case with the potato famine in Ireland because uh, when when, when potatoes came to Ireland, the whole variety of genomes of potatoes did not come, but only two small varieties vulnerable to the same pathogens. And that's why uh, they lost the entire crop. Uh, in, in that respect, um, it, what's interesting to me is that I, for the question of biodiversity, I think I might want to start with um, your evocation of cooking. That is to say, the, the point is, what's interesting to me is that a major grain, let's say like maize, is now uh, seen as a single commodity. Maybe it's graded type A, type B, type C, and it's made into flour and so on, right? Um, but people grew maize because they wanted its leaves for packaging, they wanted it to be a trellis for climbing beans. They wanted different kinds. They wanted the cob that could be used for scrubbing. Uh, different kinds of corn made different kinds of porridges, different kinds of soup. They lasted longer, they lasted less. So in a sense, the reason why France has 450 different kinds of cheeses is because there's a use for each one of these cheeses in a variety of cuisines. And once you are down to just wheat flour, right, then you've made this commodity so uniform that its many purposes are off. I know there's an effort now to grow all kinds of old emmer and einkorn wheats and so on to sort of change, right? Um, and it's an extraordinary effort actually to create new wheats for that matter. Um, but it's there at some level, one needs a consumer population that treasures that diversity in taste and use uh, and so on. Um, what was the other, the other question that I was not responding directly to? <laughs> I, I, had a, I had an answer to that, but. Yeah, well, you, you kind of did, it was more connected to, to if, if back, back in kind of these early states, distance to the oh. tax subject was so, 
you? Like, what would be that equivalent today if it's not? Yes, I, you know, a person pointed out that I, um, that my, uh, this idea that an oxen would have eaten all the things in the cart by the time you get to so much. Well, someone read that and said, um, Scott, if I may use this expression, you're full of shit. Um, that, that, that is, he, he worked in Peru and he said, you have alpacas, uh, a train of alpacas of 30 or 40 uh, led by one woman on the back of one alpaca. And they time their trips for the new pasture arriving so that uh, every time they stop in the afternoon, they have fresh pasture. And at the end of their trip, they are fatter than they were um, uh, at the beginning of the trip. And they sell them at the end of the trip because they're also good meat to sell. So it, it, it depends. It, it, I, I overlooked, you know, the idea from A to B, so much fuel. Um, I, I was overlooking right, some um, practical things that are probably fairly relevant. Although uh, it is true that for almost everything, this friction of distance, you know, uh, you know, firewood costs so much more at a distance, right? Um, yeah. And coal, and that's why, you know, industry tends to be close to coal because it costs a lot to move it. Um, yeah. Yeah, and, and I think that is something, I think that in our work has been really important to think about and where your work has been like really influential, like, understanding what is the friction, you know, what is the equivalent of this like friction of the terrain today and how also how we have to have like different, like observe it from different scales as this idea of geography and terrain is rapidly changing, right? And I think if to also borrow from, from the research of your colleague at Yale and from the School of Architecture, Keller Easterling, that speaks about the idea of extra state craft, right? And this idea of how food kind of corporations have become these extra, extra state craft machines, essentially, and that they are developing today and also dictating food policies, infrastructures, and also the consumption patterns that we kind of live according to and the environmental regulations that are supposedly governing their practices. Um, so along, I think on the one hand, kind of it's interesting also to think a bit about that your development at a part, like alongside the research that you've been doing, also your kind of um, other activities as a farmer and kind of how your kind of personal experience with a farmland um, has influenced this research and, this, and how do we kind of develop modes of resistance to agribusinesses on the one hand. And then also on the other hand, I think that reflects quite a lot with our kind of longstanding project Climavore, which basically questions how we eat as humans are changing the climate. And we go kind of the question how we need to evolve from cultivating foods, also to think about how we are cultivating habitats as we are cultivating foods. Um, and I think you already started touching about that, like with your former response um, with kind of diversity of grains, with kind of reintroducing kind of grains that are disappearing and so forth. So between your work of researching the state boundaries and those who have managed to live like beyond the limit of the state and also your practice as a farmer, what are the lessons you can reflect on as many small scale farmers and landowners are trying to revolutionize the way we produce and consume food while agribusinesses are trying to take even larger stronghold on lands and markets in simultaneously? Uh, first of all, uh, what's the name of this colleague whom I don't know in architecture? It's Keller Easterling. Keller E. Sterling? Yeah. yeah, and she wrote um, a wonderful, I mean, a few books, but uh, her previous book, one before the last, is called Extra, Extra State Craft. Thank you for introducing me to my colleague. <laughs> With pleasure. So I, I don't want to um, 
I don't want to draw many lessons from my life as a farmer. Um, the um, uh, and and I should say, I'm less of a farmer than I am a pastoralist. That is to say, what I've always been interested in is raising animals, um, uh, sheep, um, uh, some cattle, uh, even bees, if you can consider that a kind of special kind of pastoralism. Um, and uh, I learn I learn things. Um, so I, this is a very uh, English language centered uh, uh, story, but I, um, so I raised, I've been, I've raised pigs, I've milked goats, I've raised sheep, I've sheared sheep and so on. Um, and one of the things that has astounded me is that the language that we have um, uh, is, so infused with agrarian metaphors that we can hardly craft a sentence or two uh, without invoking this. So for example, um, I don't know how this will translate into Turkish, uh, but I was once weeding a row of peas with a hoe and it was a long rectangular garden and I got to the end and I said, what a long row to hoe to myself. And I realized I was using a phrase that we all use about a long job, right? Uh, and, and, and I then realized, for example, I raised this pig and I had someone else butcher it. And I was bringing back, um, you know, the, the meat from the packing, little packing house. And I realized I was bringing back the bacon, right? Which is an expression for bringing home the money. And then the first thing they had was a loin roast and uh, we were eating a high on the hog, right? Uh, which is another English expression. And then I noticed that my sheep, for example, once they had grazed down the pasture, they would be on their knees and they'd have their head through the fence because the grass was greener on the other side of the fence, right? It literally was greener on the other. Anyway, I, I realized that, uh, that I couldn't actually move through much of English without this pastoral, uh, agricultural language as a way of expressing things, um, demonstrating itself. I, to go back to the other question is, maybe you have, it seems to me that the fact that half of the world's nutritional calories come from three grains is, if you like, the, the most horrible single fact about our diets, all right? Uh, and how that came, how that came to be. Um, and, that, and, and that all of that has to do with the way in which those grains can be stored, they can be turned into flour, you know, the things that hunters and gatherers did by salting and air drying uh, um, uh, and so on. Um, what's interesting is that these major grains can store almost indefinitely under the right conditions, uh, can be transported around the world. Um, and so there's something about the uni uniformity, um, even though they are nutritionally deficient in many ways. Um, it's extraordinary the way in which they have come to dominate the cuisine of, of the world. And also ask yourself this question, um, which is, um, uh, I was asked not so very long ago. Uh, so people who study hunters and gatherers and foragers, uh, these people are eating all day long. That is, they don't have meals generally, except when they make a big kill and they sit down and you know eat it right away if they have to, like a big fish. They'll eat part of it and go to sleep for a while and take the rest back to their families or the village. But what's interesting, it seems to me, is that there, the, when did civilization develop breakfast, lunch, and dinner? 
right? The idea that there are these meals that occur at a particular time in the day, right? That have been codified in a certain way and that have a certain set of, you know, habits or customs in terms of what you eat. And I know that differs in terms of in parts of Europe where the noonday meal is more important than the evening meal and so on. But what's really interesting to me is this, if you like, codification of food habits, right? Uh, in a way that does not have to be that way, but yet are so embedded in our rights of civilization and our daily habits um, that we never question it. I mean, I'm talking about myself too, of course. Yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah. And I think that's the also key point also to, to start wrapping up. On the one hand, what you were mentioning first with language and connection to landscape, right? With all these phrases that also remind us how we used to live or our ancestors used to live. And also with these kind of pre-set conditions that many times have to do with imperial kind of forms of control or, or labor structures or yeah, kind of yeah, social structures at large. Um, and perhaps also wrapping up, um, we have a question from the audience, from Ahmed Gide, and uh, Ahmed asks uh, or mentions that we learned that Neolithic villages were formed in Gublicli Tepe uh, before agriculture started. However, these villages are abandoned also for a reason. Uh, so the question is whether this could be seen as a return to hunter-gatherer. Um, kind of structures. And um, also, Ahmed asks, how would you interpret people that establish villages without agriculture? Oh, to take the last one first, yeah. there are lots of examples of villages without agriculture, um, uh, sedentary communities in the uh, uh, wetland, the Mesopotamian uh, alluvial wetlands. Um, so uh, what's interesting there are aggregations of population uh, that are not practicing agriculture or practicing it in a very, very minor, completely marginal way. Um, and that goes on for a long time. Uh, and those, um, those people are, are still moving around when trade and so on, um, but there are permanently settled communities of up to a thousand, two thousand people um, uh, this is according to Jennifer Pornell, who's written this, I think, great book um, or a, a great dissertation. Anyway, uh, the question of Gobekli Tepe is really an interesting one. And my, I, I stand to be corrected uh, because I haven't read the latest uh, information about it. It's, it's, a, it's a stunning site and everyone debates it, I understand. Uh, and the question is, my impression was, correct me if I'm wrong, that Gobekli Tepe was a, perhaps a ceremonial site where people gathered for certain times of the year to celebrate rituals and so on, the animals they hunted, et cetera, et cetera, uh, and created stone monuments to commemorate this as a ceremonial central site but it was not a large permanent settlement that lasted hundreds of years. Um, that was my impression. And so what I took it to be an interesting demonstration of the fact that, um, you know, lots of pastoralists actually have a time and foragers for that matter, have times of year when because of climatic conditions and game, they spread out and are dispersed. And then certain times of the year, often winter, let's say, if there's less game, they will collect and live in village size units. And I thought that this might be uh, an instance of the same case and showed that these people could make people could make things out of stone as well. It didn't have to be a state. It didn't have to be a city state in order to erect a stone uh, monument of impressive dimensions. Am, am I wrong? I'm happy to be wrong because yeah. I didn't say anything. I'll go back, go back to Tepe anyway. Yeah. I don't think. Yeah. Very good. 
So until someone stands um, to prove you wrong, <laughs> um, I think <laughs> um, I think we first of all wanted to thank you for the generous time uh, you spent with us today, and we're extremely grateful for all of the work um, you've been doing. And I think uh, we stand together with uh, many generations of students and scholars and practitioners that have been really influenced uh, by the work you've done and we're excited to see um, also what comes up next and yeah thanks again for joining us here today and this talk um, will be online available as part of the exhausted website uh, and we very hope that we'll get to see you um, in London or Istanbul or yeah. anywhere else soon. Thank you this will this uh, has been an education for me and uh, you know, one one is always very proud when one's work finds, you know, uh, a usefulness in people who are very far from one's home discipline um, and good to think with. So you make me you make me proud that uh, my work has found its way uh, into uh, your section of the of the intellectual world. I'm I'm honored to have uh, proven useful. <laughs> very, thank you very, very much thank you so much you Jack bet. and also take care thank you, you very much yeah and for people that are in Istanbul or, or near Istanbul just to, to mention this is the last week of the exhibition before it closes so uh, yeah last days to enjoy thank you very thank much thank you very much and bye bye have a good day, have a good day.